Greetings everyone, I'm Adam Harrington. Welcome to the beautiful woods of Pennsylvania. Spring is here, flowers are blooming, animals are mating, and ticks are active. I can almost guarantee that at least a few ticks will latch onto my clothes if I walk through some of the thicker areas of this woodland. Because ticks are active today, I think it's a good time to talk about Lyme disease, and I want to briefly address something that confuses some people. You know, when we think about Lyme disease or any tick-associated illness, we tend to think about a few ecological associations. Japanese barberry being one, dense leaf litter perhaps, white-footed mice, and especially white-tailed deer. It's really difficult to talk about ticks and Lyme disease without talking about white-tailed deer because there are so many associations. Just think about the common name of the tick that most people encounter in this region where Lyme disease is most prevalent. We call it a deer tick, which is also called a black-legged tick. If you've ever gotten close to white-tailed deer, you've probably seen fat engorged ticks sucking their blood, which is something I'd say most deer hunters are used to seeing. And when ecologists and land managers talk about reducing the number of ticks and the prevalence of Lyme disease, they talk about strategies to reduce the deer herd. So ticks and Lyme disease and white-tailed deer, they all go together and are connected in many ways. But here's something that might sound counterintuitive, and it's something that many people don't know. Deer don't get Lyme disease, or at least deer are very, very, very unlikely to get it Ever. Why is that? If deer don't get Lyme disease, why are deer even included in the ecological association list that goes along with Lyme disease? Why are people so focused on reducing deer populations in the hopes of reducing the prevalence of Lyme disease? And if deer don't get Lyme disease, what is it about deer that makes them immune? Well, those are good questions, and to really understand what's going on, we have to say something about the biology of ticks. Deer ticks go through four stages to complete their magnificent life cycle. Egg, larva, nymph, and adult. Past the egg stage, deer ticks require blood meals at each stage. Larvae and nymphs typically feed on small mammals like chipmunks and white-footed mice, as well as some birds. And it is during these juvenile stages that ticks primarily acquire the Lyme disease bacterial spirochete known as Borrelia burgdorferi. Adult ticks primarily feed on large mammals, and wouldn't you know it, white-tailed deer are the primary mammalian hosts at this stage of the tick life cycle. So white-tailed deer are not left out of the deer tick life cycle. They act as primary blood meal hosts for adult ticks, and to a lesser extent for juvenile ticks. But unlike small mammals and birds, white-tailed deer do not transmit the Lyme disease spirochete to ticks. Deer only supply warm, nutritious blood. Now here's a good question to ask. If ticks suck the blood of white-tailed deer, which they do a lot, why don't deer get Lyme disease from ticks? You and I can get Lyme disease from ticks, and we're large mammalian hosts, but deer are immune. Why is that? Well, to get some answers, I don't think it would be a bad idea to look through the scientific literature. In a study published in 1988, researchers found that deer are incompetent reservoirs of the Lyme disease spirochete, meaning deer cannot sustain or transmit the bacteria to feeding ticks. In a study published in 1994, deer were experimentally infected with the Lyme spirochete. Although the deer developed antibodies, the spirochete itself could only be isolated in one case, from an ear punch biopsy. All other cultures of blood and tissues from infected deer remained negative. And then an interesting study was published in 2023. In this study, researchers found that white-tailed deer have a natural defense in their blood that actually kills the Lyme disease spirochete. And the mechanism responsible for killing the bacteria is likely part of the deer's innate immune system. This is a pretty amazing finding, and it helps to explain why white-tailed deer do not effectively spread the spirochete that causes Lyme disease. The blood of deer actively fights off infection. But why then do people still advocate for a reduction in the deer herd if white-tailed deer aren't reservoirs for Lyme disease, and if their blood serum kills the Lyme disease spirochete? Well, remember what we said earlier. Deer still play a critical role in the life cycle of ticks by supplying blood meals. So a management strategy that targets blood meal hosts like deer 
seems like it would be a possible solution to reducing the prevalence of Lyme disease. But it's not so straightforward, and deer reduction strategies for the purposes of reducing Lyme disease rates have been and are still debated, simply because the scientific evidence behind this approach is weak. And while complete elimination of deer in an ecologically isolated setting with few alternative hosts for adult ticks may substantially reduce the black-legged tick population, results have been mixed in circumstances where deer are not eliminated. Black-legged ticks, it turns out, are very good at finding alternative hosts in many ecosystems. And if even a few deer are left in specific areas, adult ticks will find the remaining deer and feed on them at higher rates increasing the infestation levels per deer. Like many things in nature, this whole story is a bit complicated, and it's difficult to say what should or should not be done. But I think the research is pretty clear on this point. White-tailed deer are very unlikely to get Lyme disease. They aren't even asymptomatic carriers, which many wild animals are. The blood serum of white-tailed deer is so powerful that it kills the Lyme spirochete. But you and I, we're not white-tailed deer. And no matter how hard we try, we'll never be white-tailed deer, at least in this lifetime. So we need to be proactive when it comes to protecting ourselves against tick-borne illnesses. And this is why I strongly recommend developing a personal tick strategy. And no, my strategy doesn't involve rubbing deer blood all over my body, but it does involve practicing awareness, wearing lighter colored clothing, checking my body while I'm in the woods, and again when I get home, and before I go to bed, and eating an immunosupportive diet. Your strategy might be similar, maybe it's different, that's okay. The important thing is, if you are going to spend lots of time in tick-prone areas, it's probably wise to take some precautions so that you don't acquire any illness associated with tick bites. You don't have to write down this strategy, you don't have to formalize it, you don't have to announce it to people who aren't interested in these kinds of things but spend some time thinking about it if you haven't done so already, because the last thing you want is for your time in the woods to be compromised by a tiny blood-sucking parasite. Thanks so much for watching this video. Hope you enjoyed it, hope you learned something. If you'd like to support this channel, please subscribe to the Learn Your Land YouTube channel. Head on over to learnyourland.com, sign up for the email newsletter, and check out my online courses on foraging mushrooms, tree identification, and ecology. Thanks again for watching. I will see you on the next video.